Howdy, my people. What's going on? Up to the second college football episode 10 presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. We do it for the Saturdays and Academy wants to remind you to have fun out there with Academy Sports and Outdoors. And what a great show we have for you. ESPN's Tom Luganville always has great insight. We're going to break down the AM Auburn game. Also, we got Michigan State Purdue. Just how good is Michigan State this year? Ohio State Nebraska, those two teams, Michigan State and Ohio State, could be on a collision course to meet. And, of course, LSU and Alabama, does it have the same luster? That's all coming up here on Up to the Second College Football. All right, guys, the biggest game in college football, I think, in my opinion, a and Auburn right here in College Station. Uh, but there are some big storylines to get into with our buddy Tom Luganville of ESPN and, of course, Sirius XM uh, Satellite Radio. And let's break it all down. Tom, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you doing, man? Doing great, man. Thanks for making time. So good. Let's let's start off with Georgia, the number one team in the land. Do you think that they have enough offense with Stetson Bennett to win it this year with him at the helm, or do you think when it all is said and done, they're going to need JT Daniels out there? I think to get to a championship level game, yes, they're going to have enough. I, you know, at the end of the day, the question becomes this: Can you score forty points? on Georgia, which is probably what you would likely have to do. And would Georgia help you? Meaning that they do something uncharacteristic to their nature. You know, they give up a punt return for a touchdown and they have a pick six and, you know, they just do things that that keep you in the game. You know, it's interesting what Kirby Smart seems to be doing here. And I think a lot of it is not so much based on, okay, JT Daniels might be more talented, but more so based on gauging the pulse of his football team. You know, what's this locker room like right now? Are they galvanized around Stetson Bennett? Uh, Is he a guy that they feel like maybe they can't win because of, but not necessarily in spite of either? Is as long as he does what he's supposed to do, they probably feel like they're good enough. But if they ended up getting into a scoring match, then, yeah, I, I think there are legitimate concerns there. The problem is until you get into either the SEC championship game or you get into a college football playoff scenario, we may not know that. Tom, I wanted to ask you about AM Auburn, but first thing I got to do is ask you about what's going on behind you there. You've got Batman and Superman and <laughs> Deadpool. I'm a big Batman guy. I got my coffee cup behind yeah. me. Uh, talk to me a little bit about there that. There you go. Well, my office, I've worked out of my home now for 16 years. And um, when my son was young, everything for him was Legos and superheroes. So that kind of became our bonding thing. So just about everything he's ever had or everything that we've had together now somehow resides in my room because he's 15 years old. So I got Funko Pops. I got, I got a fat head of Superman over there. We got, we got stuff going on here. You don't even want to know if I took this phone down and just did a panorama, you'd be like, what is this guy? 12? Well, hey, if my coffee cups behind me is all about Batman. I wore uh, my Batman shirt for Halloween the other day. So, all right, let's move on to the big game here for us, uh, A&M and Auburn. Uh, A&M, a team, tra- you know, their their trajectory looks to be high. Auburn, same thing. Two teams yeah. playing better uh, towards the end of the season. And, and both teams in the thick of things. You know, I think that's the one thing. And, you know, going into last week with Texas A&M being off, but Auburn playing host to Ole Miss, you know, one of the things that I thought was really, really important because I think playing at Auburn at night is one of the most difficult places to play in all of college football. Heck, it's difficult to broadcast from field level in that stadium. And I felt like Ole Miss, it wasn't just about beating Auburn. It was about handling the environment. Now you fast forward to this week, and I feel the same way about Auburn. It's not just going to be about Auburn going in there and being prepared to beat Texas A&M. It's going to be how does Auburn handle the environment? And, and those are important things. They're very, very real. And if I'm Auburn, the most important thing that happened as a team last week was they found their running game again. Tank Bigsby was big on the ground. Offensive line started to get into rhythm, took some pressure off of Bo Nix, who's played as good a football his entire career uh, over the span of this season. So he's playing very efficiently where in you know years past, he's been nothing but a roller coaster ride. And so if I look at Texas A&M right now, I've got, to, I've got to push my chips to the table and say Zach Calzada is going to progress. The one thing we cannot do is regress at the quarterback position. Um, he's going to have to play well. We know the weapons around him are outstanding. Um, they got the home field advantage. But uh, you have the bye week and you have that opportunity to fine-tune things and hit the fundamentals and the little things and have an opportunity for him to get more reps and get better because I don't believe they can beat Auburn if he regresses. 
Tom, I got to ask you about all the drama happening there at Florida. Dan Mullen's press conference, the quarterback musical chairs, just a crazy uh, time there for the Gators. Yeah, and then you see this article coming out by The Athletic and, and one of my close friends, Bruce Feldman, uh, about kind of the assistant coach confidential around the SEC and what other coaches think about this Florida team and, and Dan Mullen, and it's pretty scathing, you know, and and obviously there there's some disarray there right now. I never thought I would see a Dan Mullen coached team be so woefully inept at quarterback. They just can't seem to get it right now, whether that's coaching, whether that's scheme, whether that's two players that maybe just aren't good enough to get it done, maybe a combination of all three, but they're sloppy. They're undisciplined. Defensively, they take way too many risks to the point where you watch them on tape and, and sometimes you scratch your head and you say, that's unsound. So to me, it's not just about whether or not Florida has good enough players. I think anybody who's played against Florida or coached against Florida knows that they have athletes. But it's a little similar to the LSU situation right now where you have really good athletes that aren't very good team, that aren't playing very good football. And for whatever reason that is, it seems to be snowballed down, snowballing downhill pretty fast. Tom, that makes me think. You got Florida, a prestigious program there, the University of Texas, LSU won a national championship a couple yeah. years ago. Three big programs, all kind of with some drama off the field and not playing well on the field. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, and I, and I don't want to blame it all on this, but it, I've seen a lot of sloppiness this year. And, and I've talked to a lot of coaches each and every week when we're on the road, and almost every one of them to a man does point to the pandemic, does point to the fact that as a team, as a unit, as a program, Everybody in college football has had very little time to spend with each other and mold and gel into the unit that we all hope you can be when you kick off the season. Because this hasn't just been exclusive to this team or that team. Look at all of the upsets we're seeing in college football. What's the common denominator here? The transfer portal, NIL. There's a lot of things that are distracting. And these young people with some of these teams, as you mentioned, it with Texas, uh, LSU in particular, Nobody seems to be playing as a team. There seems to be a lot of individualism right now, especially with a lot of this NIL stuff. And, you know, that market's going to settle itself pretty quick, too. You know, you look at Dr. Pepper right now, and they're probably not really pleased with DJ Uyunglele, you know. And, and there's a lot of players like, you know, Derek King. Derek King, Miami's not even playing. And so the market's going to start to settle on whether or not some of these NIL deals were a good investment from – the endorsement side and what type of impact they have had on the team side. I, I got to ask you about a team that is playing like a team, Michigan State. I know you got them this upcoming weekend, and, and the job yeah. Mel Tucker's done there. He's a hot name with LSU and pr pr pretty much any opening out there. Uh, your thoughts on how good they actually are? Gosh, I don't know yet. I want to say that they're really, really good, but I feel like having seen Oklahoma now a couple times, having seen uh, Ohio State in person, having seen even Cincinnati, amongst others, if I put Michigan State against those teams, I don't know if Michigan State would win the game. I think what Michigan State is doing is they're doing just enough. They don't beat themselves. They're physical at the point of attack. The running back is a difference maker. Um, I don't know if they're above average at best, maybe good at quarterback, but I don't know if they're championship level good and they've had some real issues on the back end in pass defense they stopped the run well but given up a lot of explosives and the thing that they need to do is hope to god that they are not the two number two ranked team in the college football playoff uh selection tonight because if you looked at purdue's history whether it be ohio state whether it be iowa three weeks ago they love knocking off number two ranked teams and now you come off that emotional win versus your in-state rival you go on the road versus a Purdue team that is very, very capable of beating them. I, I think this has a tremendous opportunity to be a game that goes deep in to the fourth quarter and, and two challenges back-to-back -back as the schedule gets really deep for Michigan State. We're going to start knowing more and more and more about just how good they are. All right, then let me end it with this. Ohio State, a team that I thought I had figured out early on that they were going to struggle, and they're playing really good football. Both those teams, yeah. Ohio State and Michigan, uh, Michigan State, they're going to play each other eventually, and this is all going to sell itself out. How good is Ohio State? Really good from what I saw. I thought they were fantastic. The, the weapons, the quarterback play, I'm not so sure Travian Henderson isn't the best running back in the country, and he's just a true freshman. Uh, the wideouts are elite. They have offensive tackles at every off offensive line position across the board, although I thought Penn State got after them uh, pretty good uh, in the horseshoe. And then defensively, it's interesting. You know, all they really did when Matt Barnes took over as the play caller 
is they just started playing more zone, started keeping the ball in front of them, started keeping the eyes on the quarterback. It led to more tackles for loss. It led to more sacks. And I think they're second in the nation right now since week three in interceptions. And that was just a slight tweak. And all of a sudden they're playing much better defense. But I look at them and I say, okay, I'm not so sure they're not the second ranked team in the country right now, but they lost to Oregon. And I don't know if I'd put Oregon in the top five. So what do you make of that? What does the committee make of that? Do they value a win? Do they value a loss? Or do they value who you are right now? Tom, we appreciate it, sir. Thanks so much. You bet. Thanks for having me. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels, plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, guys, now we move on to the big game of the week, and it's a huge showdown right here in College Station. You've got AM taking on Auburn, the 2.30 game on CBS. And for an Auburn perspective, we're joined by Jason Cowell of AUTiger.com. And from an AM perspective, we've got my buddy Olin Buchanan from Texas, the columnist, and, of course, my morning partner here. Olin and uh, Jason, thanks for joining us. So this Auburn team, it looks to me that they don't appear to be the same team that lost early on to uh, Penn State, a very close game. It seems that they've evolved quite a bit. How much have they changed? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of seeing a team that's that's grown up in a new offensive and defensive system. I think especially offensively, this is much different. This this resembles more of Jimbo Fisher than it did Gus Malzahn. You know, they're under center at times, you know, putting a little bit more on the plate of the quarterback at the line of scrimmage. So I think it's just been about watching a, a team evolve, um, you know, in a new system for the first time. And so – They've definitely grown up. I think you look at quarterback play, look at the play of the wide receivers the last couple of weeks. Offensive lines, you know, is doing better things. Uh, yeah, I think it's a matter of just not a not players maturing, but I think a team maturing uh, into new systems. Obi, I would say the same question for you. This A&M team is not the same team that we saw lose to Arkansas State and Mississippi State. How have they grown? Well, I think it just starts with uh, the quarterback, Zach Calzada, getting more comfortable and understanding what's being asked from him. Uh, I think he still has a lot of room for improvement. I think A&M has improved as Zach Calzada has improved. When uh, Zach Calzada had trouble, when he struggled, A&M struggled. He played a, a great game against Alabama individually, and so A&M as a team had a great game. And, you know, he's been uh, – uh, he's a little bit up and down against Missouri, and so was A&M. So I think uh, A&M kind of goes as Zach, as Zach Calzada goes, uh, and as he – the more playing time he gets, the more comfortable he gets, uh, the more efficient the A&M offense is. Jason, the uh, narrative before the season started was it was going to take Brian Harson some time to figure out the SEC way. It looks like he's figured it out. Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I really think that one of the keys for this team was was being able to go and play at Penn State early in the year. Um, now, the Penn State team I've seen the last couple of weeks did not resemble a whole lot the team I saw in week three. Um, but that wide-out atmosphere, uh, going up there, playing in that environment, I think it was really big for coaches, players, everybody. They got a taste of you know what, what life's like going on the road in the SEC. And it gave them an idea of, hey, how are we going to respond? How are the players responding? Coaches and players learned a lot about each other. And so you know, that was, a, I think, a big deal for this team to have that experience. And obviously then you, know, you go on the road and play LSU, um, have Georgia at home, go to Arkansas. They've had, you know, they've had some, some big-time atmospheres and experiences already. So I think the schedule has helped them learn a lot about each other in a short period of time, um, you know, Obviously, we talk about all the time in college football, you don't have any preseason games. They had two games that gave them a little bit of a warm-up, but, man, the, the Penn State game, to me especially, I thought was really big for them to kind of learn, you know, in the face of adversity, you know, how, how everybody was going to respond. Oh, Olin, let's talk a little bit about Jimbo in that same vein. The narrative of it has changed with him too, right? Like there was a point, especially after those two losses, like, oh, I can't believe A&M is paying him $9 million a year. But you see what he's been able to do to turn this program around, or this season around, I should say, and then what is happening there in Gainesville. Talk about 
the uh, perception of Jimbo now after a lot of these things have happened in their favor? Well, I think any time, uh, for, for some reason, with the national media, any time that uh, A&M has anything that even resembles a struggle, no matter what the reason, uh, uh, the national media seems to jump on it. I think there's still a lot of folks in the national media that are somehow offended by Jimbo Fisher's salary as if they're having to pay part of it. Uh, but when you come back uh, uh, and, and beat Alabama and then you know win your next two games after that, I thought the Missouri game, uh, even though Missouri's not strong, to come back on the road after beating Alabama and figuring there you know, probably could be a significant hangover, but to go – win that game handily, and then you know uh, you play a South Carolina team that's not very good, but you do what you're supposed to do to teams that are struggling, and you beat them bad. So uh, I think that means you take it, or at least you should take a step back and say, okay, maybe all that uh, criticism on Fisher that that uh, so many writers and, and others, uh, commentators were so quick to make uh, – this after they had, you know, had it wasn't just Zach Calzada hurt. It was injuries in the offensive line, injuries at cornerback. Um, uh, now you have to go back and say, hey, he's addressed those things, and he's being able to uh, get this team better and get this team to keep playing, feel like there's something to play for, and quite frankly, they're still in the mix to maybe even finish ten and two if everything goes right. So. I think then you take a second look and say, well, you know, I don't know if anybody's worth as much money as as he's getting, but if he is, if they are, you know, he's showing that he's worth it. Hey, Jason, what did Auburn do last week to really slow down Ole Miss? I know they have some injuries over there, but it it did not seem like that same Ole Miss team that we had seen most of the year. Uh, Yeah, I think they did a good – yeah, this team has done a good job in the red zone and done a good job on on third and fourth down. I think the biggest thing they did was not give up big plays. That's what you know. That's what you can't do. Ole Miss, the team that runs the football really well, Auburn didn't did not give up a run over ten yards. And so they give up some plays, they give up some yards, uh, and, but making people drive the length of the field has kind of been kind of been the 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 emphasis for Derek Mason early this year and since the early part of the year. Now against you know against Penn State, against Georgia, a couple they had a, a couple of busts that. In, in the secondary, they gave up some pretty wide open plays, um, but now they've kind of shored those things up. The more they played together, but it's really about limiting big plays for this team. Um, you know, try to try to put people in third and long situations if possible, and then put some pressure on quarterbacks. And uh, they've done a good job of that. But they've got some versatility on defense, some guys that can move around, play some different things. So I, I think they've just continued to grow a little bit. But yeah, I would say probably the biggest thing is is that. You limit big plays, and then you got a coach on the other sidelines who just feels like every fourth down he's going to go for it. Um, probably cost himself another six points, and it may change the way the game's played. You know, in the fourth quarter, if if he kicks a couple of those field goals, but that's Lane Kiffin. That's who he is. He's going to live by the fourth down try and die by the fourth down try. Oh, and what about the bye week for Texas A&M? Did it come at a good time, and what was the goal during that that period? Well, I think, you know, like they always say, it's it's cliche and it's coach speak, but the goal is to get better. Uh, I think it came at a good time. Uh, uh, Tyree Johnson hurt. I think, uh, you know, Zach Calzada has been limping a little bit, so you had, a uh, you know, an, an extra week to get those guys right. And I think any time uh, you, you have some extra time to really work with Calzada, it's it's beneficial because, again, uh, here's a guy that we didn't think was going to play really at all, um, and he's been steadily getting better. And uh, I think the more that you can coach him up, the more time you get to coach him up, uh, the better. And and now you got that extra week before uh, this Auburn game that's turned out to be uh, – I mean, it's always going to be a big game because Auburn's always a good opponent. But now you look at where both teams are, and uh, what's out, you know, what, what's possible for both teams. So now it's become an even bet, bigger game. It's it's the biggest game uh, on the national schedule this year. All right, Jason, let's uh, talk about a key for Auburn. What what is the key for them to win? Yeah, I think you know you look at this Texas A&M defense, and you know what you're going to get there. But Auburn, they got to find a way to continue to run the football. Um, 
you know, they, they, they ran the ball better against Ole Miss, and, and Ole Miss had improved somewhat, but they're still not on the level of a Texas A&M defense. You know, Tank Bigsby, um, Jarquez Hunter, a true freshman, has, has really run the ball well, but I think you got to continue to do those things. But, you know, they've done a good job of kind of throwing to set up the run. Um, I would expect them to continue to do some of those things, try to be balanced. But those things on offense and defense, you know, you look and probably one of the bug moves for them has been the tight end position. So you look at Jalen Watermeyer, you can't let him have one of those monster nights that he's capable of. I think that's the, that's the goal. And you got to put the game in Zach Calzada's hands and make him beat you. Um, you know, those are probably the, the ultimate goals for Auburn, you know, come Saturday. Olin, I'll follow up with you. Same kind of question. What does A&M have to do? Yeah, it's like old-time football. Uh, you're going to have to run the football because that's what A&M does best. And I think you have to uh, do everything you can to make Ole Miss, I'm sorry, uh, Auburn one-dimensional. And that starts with stopping the run or at least containing it. If you can keep uh, Tank Bigsby uh, you know, around 80 yards or less, and, and that's easier said than done, but if you can do that, then uh, – I think uh, you you would prefer that Bo Nix have to win the game with his arm. I'm not saying that he can't, but you would prefer that than having to constantly be in uh, short yardage because Tank Bigsby's running well on you. So if you can if you can uh, slow down their running game significantly and then have success running the football when you have it, uh, I think that's what A and M has to do. All of you, Cannon, Jason Caldwell, thank you so much, guys. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, it just doesn't have that same ring to it, but LSU and Alabama this upcoming weekend. Alabama, obviously the number two team in the country. LSU struggling this year. Tony Sukalis with us from BamaInsider.com as he joins us on most weeks. Tony, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Uh, We're finally getting that fall weather in Tuscaloosa, so it's nice to have. Yeah, we're getting that here in in Texas as well. How how did the bye week treat Bama uh, injuries and mentality and everything going on over there? Yeah, it it was needed. I think they had a few guys that were a little bit banged up, so it's nice that, you know, for them to kind of be able to rejuvenate themselves and and head into what's going to be, you know, always a tough month in November. I think when you're looking at Drew Sanders um, battling back from that wrist, uh, hand slash wrist injury actually caused him to miss the A&M game. And, um, you know, a few, the last few weeks, um, he's a possibility depending on how things go, he, he might be ready for LSU. So Alabama should be relatively healthy for that game. Uh, when, when you look at, you know, the, some of the guys that have been out, um, so it, you know, they're, they're in a pretty good shape injury wise. I think the bye week also helped them kind of regroup and, and, and kind of fix some of the mistakes that, you know, that, that they needed to, to make moving forward. Tony, from an uh, Alabama LSU perspective, it just doesn't feel the same because LSU is not the monster that they have been in years past. Uh, what is the vibe out there? I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, with Nick, he's treating it like it's the biggest game of the year, but just what's the feel around it? Yeah. I mean, let's not forget that the last time that LSU came into Bryant Denny stadium, they, they won uh, a really important game. And then, you know, their head coach said that, you know, they, they, they pretty much owned this place, you know? So I think that Alabama fans remember that uh, they remember a lot of the antics that happened, uh, um, you know, after the game at Brian Denny stadium, Alabama players were asked about that. Uh, they didn't make too much of it, but they did say that, you know, some of those things were, were taken personal and that, you know, I think Alabama will play with a little bit of a chip on its shoulder and kind of like, kind of finally get that taste from that 2019 loss. They, they, they want to get that out of their mouth. Um, but like you said, this, this is usually a matchup that determines the SEC West, and it's, it's really not this year. It's Obviously, it's an important game for Alabama, but in terms of LSU, um, they're kind of their own little mess over there. So it's not the, the two juggernauts that it normally is. I mean, most of the years, except for last year, um, it's been a matchup between two ranked teams. And so you're kind of seeing LSU fall off after that national title run. Uh, so that's kind of taken a little bit of a hit to this rivalry, but it's still an anticipated game. It's still a game that players expect to be physical. Um, there's a lot of passion both ways. So uh, I know you did a piece recently on some of the big plays between these two teams. Any particular play to you that sticks out one or two plays that are like, hey, that's that game? Yeah, I, I think, you know, just from 
I don't know. I remember where I was when it happened. Uh, the, the TJ yelled in screen pass. Um, that was almost, that was such a game clincher that um, that was crazy. Uh, that's the one that to me that stands out. Uh, that was in 2012. Um, the, the first game, I guess, after the, the national championship game between the two earlier that year, um, it, you know, it, it was kind of, uh, that was a crazy game where they, they got the ball back down by three with about a minute and a half left and they drove down. And then with, with about a minute left, uh, McCarron hits TJ Yeldon for a screen pass. That was crazy. Um, there was the big hit from Ruben Foster on, on Leonard Fournette. Um, what year was that? 2000, was that not the 2014, I believe, um, that was, that was a crazy one as well. And then, um, you know, that was another comeback for Alabama last second field goal. They had the, the, the kickoff right before the end of regulation and, uh, Ruben Foster just, you know, bulldozers, uh, Leonard Fournette, which, is, which is pretty hard to do. Alabama ends up winning in overtime. Um, you know, uh, on the other side of the rivalry, I, one of the more inexplainable plays was, uh, you kind of knew that 2019 game wasn't going to go the way it was supposed to go. Uh, when Tua looks like he has a, a clear run at the end zone and just uh, ghost fumbles the ball. Um, I know that probably had to do something with his injured ankle, but that was kind of one of the crazier ones to see as well. So th there's, I mean, you could really find a, a memorable play from each one of these, even, you know, even last year's game with the blowout, you had that great catch from Devonte Smith ends up being probably the signature moment of his Heisman campaign. So this game might, this upcoming week, it might not be a great game, but I guarantee it's going to have a, a great moment from it. Hey, let's talk a little bit about Bryce Young in the conversation all season long for Heisman. Uh, Kenneth Walker the third is starting to get into that mix as well. Matt Corral, a little banged up. It's still in the mix. How do you see that right now? This is the month where, where Heisman's are won. So I, I think that, you know, it, not only does Alabama have to be focused, uh, I think if Bryce Young wants to win this award, he's going to have to put up some, uh, some big performances. This is where voters really kind of uh, narrow in. So you saw Kenneth Walker have such a big game against Michigan. I think, you know, if he continues to, to, to go on that trend and, and Bryce Young slips up, I think it could definitely go to him. I don't think that there's one candidate out there that's really kind of pulled away from the pack, so to say. So I think Bryce Young's in a great position to win the award. I think he'll have plenty of opportunities. Um, you, you know, he'll, he'll have the Iron Bowl, which looks like it could be the, it looks like what the Iron Bowl it looks like what the LSU game normally is, where, where it could decide the SEC West. So that will be big for him. And then um, if Alabama navigates this month the way it should, he uh, Bryce Young will basically have uh, the ultimate showcase where he'll face Georgia in the SEC championship game. And I honestly think that the, the Heisman can be decided in that game. But as far as where he is right now at this moment, I think Bryce Young's in a really comfortable spot for the Heisman. I think he's going to have the stage he needs to. Um, the bye week probably allowed him to, to gel with his receivers a little bit more. I, I know he's building chemistry throughout the season. That shouldn't be necessarily something that's off at this point in the season, but that extra week always kind of helps a little bit with that as well. So um, I would say that he's still the front runner in my opinion, but Kenneth Walker, like you said, man, he is um, hitting his stride at the right time. And that's what you have to do to win this award. All right. So you mentioned there the, uh, the game against Auburn, that game is at Jordan Hare. So if from an A and M perspective, and I'm and I'm thinking from an A and M perspective, A and M can win out, which is still a big F. With you know they got a couple of tough games this weekend against Auburn, they're going to be really rooting for the Auburn Tigers that weekend because then they can find themselves in the driver's seat. So even though Alabama is his top dog and we expect them to continue, there's still some moving pieces out there. Yeah, and then the crazy thing is, you know, what if A and M somehow does get in, and what if they just somehow slap Georgia in the SEC championship game. Does a, does a and get into the playoff? You'd, you'd be hard pressed not to get them in the playoff if they've beaten uh, Alabama and Georgia. So it might not be all over for A&M too. The, the, they certainly have to have the cards fall in, in the right way, but um, might not ride off the Aggies just yet. Uh, Cause it, it's going to be hard to leave out an SEC champion uh, Aggies team uh, if it has beaten Alabama and Georgia. So yeah, they, they'll definitely be big Auburn fans if that is the case um, come, come that time. You're, you're definitely right about that. Well, and Tony, I'll, I'll leave it with this. All these teams outside of Alabama, Auburn is looking to have a banner year potentially. A&M looking to have a banner year potentially. They could also all flounder down the stretch and be 7-5. and five. So there's a lot on the table. I don't think that can happen to Bama, but um, A&M and, and Auburn both have a lot to play for, and uh, the SEC West is certainly fun. Tony, we appreciate your time, buddy. 
Hey, yeah, thanks for having me on as always. All right, guys, things are getting interesting there in the Big Ten. You got number six, Ohio State at Nebraska. Is this going to be a bloodbath for Scott Frost? A lot of people thinking his days are coming close to an end. We'll break it down with Kevin Noon of BuckeyeScoop.com. Kevin, how are you, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. All right, so uh, let's go back to the Penn State game. What did you learn about both teams and just the, the way that game played out? Well, I'll start with the opponent. We learned that Sean Clifford at quarterback wasn't as injured as, as we thought he was. We found out that that defense, despite playing some less than powerful offenses along the year, truly was as advertised. Uh, they did a good job of confusing Ohio State. The Buckeyes struggled in the red zone, only getting a touchdown on, on one out of six tries, having to settle for four field goals. So, I mean, you never want to necessarily manufacture adversity. That was real adversity. But, you know, I think it's important for Ohio State after the Oregon game, everything came kind of very easily for them. They get into this situation. They get pushed. They end up getting out of that game with a nine-point win. I think it helps refocus them, recenter them as they get ready for this uh, four-game stretch. How much has C.J. Stroud improved this year just from where we saw those early pitfalls to the level he's playing at right now? I think he's improved a lot. I, mean, I think a lot of people may say, oh, did he take a step back in that game? Penn State really had a no joke for the for its back seven. I mean, they were able to do a lot of things in terms of uh, in, in pass coverage. C.J. Stroud did revert a little bit to some high balls early in the game, which was something that we saw earlier in the season, maybe just the enormity of the situation. But once he calmed down, it got a lot better. But I think his decision making, I think his mechanics are all, you know, significantly better than they were when he was a really a first time starter on the collegiate level. So he's he's a much better quarterback now than he was day one. But, you know, we maybe did see a little bit of regression, but I think a lot of that is can be attributed to what Penn State threw at him. So Nebraska has not won in this series since 2011. Do you expect any kind of threat this Saturday? Well, if you look at Nebraska, they've had, what, six games that have been decided by eight points or less, um, including Oklahoma, for that matter. So, I mean, I think Ohio State can't come in and just say, well, we're, we're just going to roll it out there and we're going to be 21 points better than these guys. I think they're going to have to come out, play well, execute, and, and respect what can happen on a, in a road environment. I mean, nobody expected 2011 to happen, and then Braxton Miller gets hurt, Joe Bosman comes in, goes one of ten passing, you, everybody's seen the memes of the Joe Bosman passing chart, so you just never know what can happen in that type of game. But, you know, I like Ohio State to, to be pretty comfortable in that game, but certainly not something to where you can just show up and go through the motions. Kevin, a lot of people are asking for an expanded playoffs. Basically, a lot of teams in the SEC and the Big Ten are already starting that playoff run. If you look at what uh, Ohio State has in front of them, they still got the Michigan State game, obviously the Michigan game. How does the season play out, you think? Well, I think that they're going to get a nice tune up here with Nebraska and then they come home and play Purdue. I mean, Purdue did knock off then number two, Iowa, you know, Purdue certainly presents some challenges, but Purdue on the road is not Purdue at home and Ohio state's getting them at Ohio stadium. So I'm not expecting much there. And then, yeah, you have that little two game gauntlet with Michigan state and Michigan. And I think that that's going to be a challenge. I think Michigan state is really peaking at the right time. Kenneth Walker, the third is a tremendous running back, the wake forest transfer, uh, you know, I think that their passing game is in a little bit of trouble if Jalen Naylor misses any significant time. But the Achilles heel for Michigan State is the defense. And then on the other side, you have Michigan, who suddenly found a passing game in its most recent game. But is was that a mirage or is that going to be something there? Because I think that's where they're vulnerable. And I also think they're a little vulnerable in the back end for throwing. So I like Ohio State to run the four games, but then again, I probably picked Ohio State to beat Oregon by 17 points. So, you know, what the heck do I know? <laughs> all right, Kevin. So let's just say they do win out. Are they one of the final four teams when it's all said and done? I think as long as they draw a good matchup in the Big Ten championship game and look look good there, I think they will be. I think we get nervous that they're going to be five undefeated teams at the end of every season. It's going to just screw everything up. And then we get to the end and there's one, two, zero. So I think that, you know, I think everything will cannibalize itself. The Big Ten certainly will cannibalize itself. I mean, if Ohio State wins its next four plus the Big Ten championship game, they're, they're going to be the last team standing at that point. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that Oregon's going to be able to run the table. I'm not convinced that Oklahoma is going to be able to run the table with Bedlam coming up at the end of the regular season. Uh, if you're an Ohio State fan, you just don't want to see something crazy happen in the SEC and that you have both Alabama and Georgia standing at the end of the season. All right, Kevin. Thanks so much, my friend. Absolutely.
All right, that does it for episode 10 of Up to the Second College Football presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. We will see you guys next week.